The gag reflex always gets a few snickers at the back. I don't know why. Um, also known as the pharyngeal reflex is another one of those protective reflexes of the airway. So whereas swallowing is a series of events when an expected object is passed to the posterior oral cavity and then the oral pharynx and then you, you swallow, it goes down the esophagus. The gag reflex is the response to uh, usually an unexpected object poking the back of the oral cavity, the oropharynx, and triggering the muscles back there to contract, so protecting the airway. Um, let's have a look at the anatomy of this. Um, the sensory nerve, the reflex in the brainstem, the motor nerve. And is this reflex the same for everybody? And how can you use it clinically? Now, we're focused in the oral cavity here. So here's the oral cavity, but the oral cavity passes back to the oropharynx. So the pharynx is the space posterior to the oral cavity, the nasal cavity, and the larynx. The posterior third of the tongue, the soft palate, the, we've got a palatine tonsil in there, uh, the walls of the, of the space back here, and the pharynx. They have somatic sensory innovation. So we're talking about somatic sensors here, as in you're aware of what that feels like. You can, depending upon the sensitivity of your gag reflex, you can, you can poke the soft palate with your tongue, right? So these are somatic sensors, pressure sensors, touch sensors, similar to the sensors of the skin. And they're back here. And the nerve that's carrying the sensory information back here from back here to the brainstem is the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve nine, glossopharyngeal. So glosso refers to the tongue, pharyngeal returns, refers to the pharynx. So this region back here at the posterior part of the tongue and the pharynx, the glossopharyngeal nerve has um, a few jobs to do back here. So that's the sensory limb. So the nerve fibers from those various structures around here come together and become the glossopharyngeal nerve with other fibers because the glossopharyngeal nerve's got a few other jobs to do as well. Um, but this back here, that's the mastoid process. This here is the styloid process. So between the stylopharyngeus muscle, running from the styloid process to the pharynx, and the styloglossus muscle, running from the styloid process to the tongue, it runs through there. And uh, back here, we've also got uh, pharyngeal constrictor muscles making the, the posterior and lateral walls of the pharynx. So between the superior and middle pharyngeal constrictor muscles, there's a gap. So the glossopharyngeal nerve passes through that gap, so it passes inferior to the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle. And that's how it gets out of the pharynx. And then it's gonna run around, curves around to pass back to um, the cranial cavity, it passes through the jugular foramen. So through the jugular foramen past cranial nerves 9, 10 and 11. Glossopharyngeal nerve goes in there. I have a glossopharyngeal nerve somewhere. Um, <laughs> I've got a lot of nerves. So uh, this nerve running with the internal carotid artery is the vagus nerve. Uh, this nerve running around here to the, uh, get under the tongue is the hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve 12. So it's, it's way in there. The, uh, the glossopharyngeal nerve is way in there, so it's deep. Because it's, it's deep within the pharynx, there's a lot of anatomy in here, it's very intricate. But the glossopharyngeal nerve is carrying that sensory information back to the brainstem. If you've been watching a lot of these reflex videos, you might be picking up on some trends of how many of these afferents are taking the same route. Anyway, we can take the brain out. So we're really not going very far, just whoop, and then we're into the brainstem. So here's the brain stem and we have the medulla oblongata and the pons and the midbrain and we're way low down. So this is cranial nerve nine and we number these sequentially as we descend. So the glossopharyngeal nerve is gonna enter the medulla oblongata. Um, it has a, has a couple of ganglia on its way. It has a superior and inferior ganglia. Um, 
which demonstrates its sensory roles. Uh, so we see sensory nerves of the body have a ganglion, a collection of nerve cell bodies, um, because of the way they formed in the embryo. Uh, anyway, um, and that sensory input goes into the medulla and it goes into, in this case, the solitary nucleus, the nucleus solitarius, as we see a lot of visceral afferents, a lot of sensory things going in here. Confuses me a little bit that because these are surely somatic afferents, uh, somatic afferents. So wouldn't they go into the trigeminal nucleus? But no, the gag reflex is always described as sensory input, glossopharyngeal nerve into the, the solitary nucleus. And then the solitary nucleus connects to the nucleus ambiguous uh, very nearby and the nucleus ambiguous sends fibers out through the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve of course has many many jobs to do but in this case those fibers these are somatic motor fibers that are running with the vagus nerve down to the pharynx so the vagus nerve will leave the cranial cavity through the jugular foramen and it's going to drop down in the neck, it's going to drop down with the internal jugular vein and the internal carotid artery. So it's, it's going to travel right next to the pharynx. So some branches jump off into the pharynx and they will innervate the muscles of the soft palate, those pharyngeal muscles, the pharyngeal constrictors and what have you. And that then is the efferent part of the gag reflex, the motor part of the gag reflex. So we don't have to travel very far anatomically. Um, the mucosa at the back of the oral cavity or the oropharynx um, sends information through the glossopharyngeal nerve back to the brainstem, nucleus solitarius, nucleus ambiguous, motor fibers in the vagus nerve back to the muscles of the soft palate and the pharynx. Uh, an unexpected object pokes these tissues back here, triggers the gag reflex or the pharyngeal reflex. The soft palate elevates, the muscles of the pharynx constrict and the airway is protected. So that is the somatogenic response, the somatogenic nature of that reflex. That's a clear uh, reflex arc, right? There's also a psychogenic form to this. You may have experienced um, an imagined stimulus um, causing the gag reflex to occur. So higher centers are clearly tied into this and just the thought of an unexpected object poking the back of the oral cavity. This can be heightened with anxiety. So some people um, struggle to go to the dentist. They're nervous about going to the dentist. Maybe they also have a sensitive gag reflex. And of course, a lot of the dental work is in the back of the oral cavity and that can further sensitize the gag reflex and cause um, <laughs> the gag reflex to occur when the dentist is trying to work. So the somatogenic component is that, and the psychogenic component is that bit, thinking about something, and can also be triggered by disgust, right? So maybe around 10 to 15% of people have a very sensitive gag reflex, a hypersensitive gag reflex. And maybe around a third of people don't have a gag reflex at all, it's completely absent. It can be, it can be unlearned, sword swallowers of the circus of a, the textbook example of that, and then it can be relearned. Um, after birth, the gag reflex is really sensitive. Um, and then, what, six to nine months after birth, as the, as the brain develops, that very sensitive gag reflex is diminished so that the baby can eat solid food. So there's obviously a protective mechanism very, very early on. Baby just drinks milk, right? And as they develop and they need to eat solid foods, so that is all managed. So that's what's going on there. These higher centers are having an effect on, on that reflex. People that have a hypersensitive gag reflex may struggle eating certain foods um, and swallowing pills, swallowing medication which can cause problems clinically. But otherwise, in terms of the cranial nerve exam, it's not a great, a great thing to have as part of the standard cranial nerve exam, partly because it's very unpleasant and partly because it is normal to be absent. So how useful is it? However, if you're trying to determine brainstem death, um, many brainstem reflexes are performed and the gag reflex is one of them. So if all the the brainstem reflexes are absent, then that's a, an indicator of brainstem death, right?
And you may be aware that the gag reflex can also induce vomiting. But there's more to vomiting than just the gag reflex. So the reflex is involved in vomiting. That's a story for another day. We'll have a look at that anatomy. It's on my to-do list. Um, but hopefully that was interesting. The gag reflex is a nice, simple, self-contained one. See you next week.